Hi everybody, uh, my name is Stefan. I'm going to be talking about productivity today, but before that, uh, I want to say something every, every time I'm doing public speaking. I have a stage fright. Uh, it's definitely not my first time, but I'm always very nervous. And there are a couple of things I do to deal with this nervousness. First, I enjoy seeing pictures of somebody who is in pain. That way I know that I cannot fail to look bad. That way I know there is really <laughs> Then I try to entertain the attendees in uh, various different ways. For example, I know that some of you here are geeks, so here's the pile, the number five. Uh, since functional programming seems, seems to be the new thing here some place to go. It's the game of life, I think. Here's cute kitten. If you're not a cat person, here's a cute dog. <laughs> and finally, here's just some random stuff. Here's the dog. Uh, Riding the tube, here's a priest in a tank. And finally, here's Batman riding the unicorn. There we go. So, uh, you can follow me on Twitter or on GitHub. This is my username. I'm Bulgaria. I'm a programmer. I write code for money. And if you need to classify me, I'm a Ruby programmer. Uh, before I started doing Ruby, I've done all those. Uh, I think I the, like the language I did most programming other than Ruby was Java. Uh, but I personally tend to love programming languages. My current uh, enjoyment is Clojure. I'm not going to talk about Clojure. I'm just mentioning it if you want to talk about Clojure after this talk. As I said, I'm going to talk about productivity. And uh, to be clear, by productivity I mean maximizing the amount of work you get done but, uh, while minimizing the effort you spend. Now, there's a disclaimer. Uh, those things are going to be slightly biased towards Ruby programmers. They are still going to be useful for everybody, but they work best for us. Who here is a Ruby programmer? <laughs> <laughs> so just so you guys can get the idea, an idea we tend to use lightweight editors like Vim or TextMate, we tend to spend a lot of time in the terminal, we tend to use Git in the terminal, and the only thing we compile is CoffeeScript. JavaScript. I'm not really sure if you can call this compilation. Another disclaimer is that all the tricks I'm going to show you might or might not work for you. I know, I know they work for me, but uh, in the end, productivity is something very personal. Uh, even if they don't work for you, at least they should give you some ideas. So I've broken my talk in four general subjects. General productivity, things applicable to everyday life, things applicable to the office, things applicable to programming, and finally, how to make your own productivity tools. <coughs> I've organized this into 24, let's say, suggestions. And this talk is going to have a slightly unusual format. So, everything is going to be time boxed. And Adi told me that I should involve it. So, here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to begin with the four-minute intro, the one I'm doing right now. And then I'm going to talk about the first subject for about 10 minutes. After this time, let's do QA. Uh, if you want to ask me something, do it. If you want to share your experience with productivity, do it. Or if you want to tell me that an idea I showed you is stupid, do it. Then we go back to the second subject. We do QA again and so on. And again, please feel free to share things that work for you, not only questions. So, let's begin with general productivity. My first suggestion is about keeping track of the things you must do and I propose maintaining only three lists. Let's call the first one the to-do li to -do list. Uh, write down there things you must do, like obligations or commitments. The second one is the watch list. Put down things you need to remember, th things you need to follow up, or things you're waiting for to happen. And finally, a later list, where you put everything that you would eventually want to do if you have time. Then, uh, each night before you go to bed, pick from three to five items from those lists and write them down on a piece of paper or on a next card. And just try doing it on the next day. If you, if you start doing this approach, you'll discover two things. First, it's actually hard to do the three things you wanted to do on the previous night. And second, uh, you'll be surprised how many days you spent where you didn't get three to five significant things done. Second suggestion is about using timers and alarms. Now, this is all about getting into 
the flow. Uh, I guess you could follow her this, uh, this phrase, like means being really, really focused and enjoying what you're currently doing. And my suggestion is using alarms to divorce yourself from the clock. Say you have uh, an appointment at 4 o'clock to a dentist. Don't, don't look uh, at the wall every, every 30 minutes to see what time is it. Instead, set up an alarm and forget about the clock. When the alarm rings, you know that it's time to go for the dentist. Uh, that's because periodically checking the time kind of breaks your flow and it can put extra stress for you. Uh, if you. If you go too deep, you would like suddenly wait all time to it. Am I late now? Uh, there's a flip side on this. Uh, you can use timers to put pressure on yourself, and this is a good, uh, good kind of pressure. If you time box yourself, you won't slack, you won't distract yourself, you won't go into a tangent, exactly like I'm doing right now. I have a timer that I have 10 minutes to talk about. Third one, uh, it's called sign field calendars. So, Aristotle said that uh, we are what we repeatedly do. Therefore, excellence is not an act, it's habit. And Establishing good habits is paramount to doing quality work. We really need to have good habits. Ken Beck says that he's not a great programmer, he's an okay programmer with great habits. I'm going to show you a very simple way of establishing habits. It's called Seinfeld Calendars. It's uh, named after the comedian Jerry Seinfeld. And he used, he used it to improve the quality of his jokes. Here's how it works. You put a calendar on the wall and then you choose an action which would help you to reinforce a habit. In his case, it was writing a joke each day. Then you put an X on each day uh, where you perform this action. Eventually, you start getting chains four or five days in a row when you did this action. And now comes the important part. Don't break the chain. Try to have the longest chain possible. It's really simple, but it works great. And here's why. It gamifies habit acquisition. It makes picking up a new habit fun. Uh, it can serve, serve as, a, as an extra motivator. For example, in 2010, I set up to lose a lot of weight. I managed ever since I've been gaining it back. But the reason I managed was because I used uh, Seinfeld calendars for eating healthily and for exercising. It was actually fun. Uh, I found that uh, not want, wanting to break this chain was just what I needed to get at 6 o'clock in the morning and go for a jog. When I tried later, I tried without this approach and I failed. Anyway, fourth suggestion, keep notes all the time. I really do mean all the time. I can see three things, uh, three ways in which notes can help you. First, they let you capture insight. You have this idea and you want to write it down somewhere so you, you don't forget it. Second, you can summarize information. You read a book or you listen to a talk and you make quick notes so you know what you need to remember. And finally, they can enhance your thinking process. If you sit down and start scribbling, doodling, or mind mapping, you start hearing new ideas. Always get ready means taking notes around. Everywhere you are, when you're in the bed and you're traveling on the bus or on your desk. Here's how I go about it. I have a small mosque that I always carry with me. And if we have a conversation and you tell me something interesting, I'll take my mosque and write it down. Like my mosque is with my patch here. I have a larger one I keep uh, in my bag and I'll use it to write longer things when I'm when I'm calm and I can want to reason a bit about it. I have a Dropbox folder full of text files with very similar sort of things I learned. And finally, I have a large notebook on my desk that I would use to scribble, write random stuff, and so on. There are other things that might work for you voice memos, you can use index cards, you can create your personal wiki, you can use specialized soft software like Evernote. It really doesn't matter. What's important, uh, check your notes regularly. It really doesn't make sense to write something down and then never read it again. Uh, establish a habit, like do it on the bus or during breakfast, or even set up a reminder. Fifth one, control your decision fatigue. 
where decisions to take uh, refers to the deteriorating quality of decisions after you spend long periods of making decisions. Essentially means that if you spend the full day doing decisions, you're way better in the beginning of the day than on the end of the day. Basically making decisions wears you down, wears you down, it tires you. And it's really important to separate the important decisions from the unimportant decisions. There's a nice, nice uh, article on Lifehacker about Barack Obama and his productivity tricks. Uh, just to give you an idea. So he has a war wardrobe with two kinds of suits. Blue suits and grey suits. One day he'll pick the blue one, the next day he'll pick the grey one, the next day he'll pick the blue one again. He keeps alternating them. He doesn't spend any effort in the morning deciding how to dress. So, basically, avoid making those kinds of decisions with strict routines. Like, here are some things you can apply to. Where to go for lunch? What to listen to? When to check your mail? When to leave work? Or even when, what to do next? If you think really, really hard about uh, data-driven development, it kind of automates the last question. You always know what to do next. Either you write the test, you make the test pass, or you're refactoring. And like, by the way, even if you have a lunch schedule, it's okay to break it. Like, if you feel really hard about going for Indian today, just go for Indian today. Don't care what you decided yesterday. But still, it's nice not to have to think about this. And finally, learn how to learn. Our ability to learn is our most important asset as knowledge workers. There's uh, really a lot to say on the subject, and I'm not going to go there. Instead, I'm going to try to get it read book. And this is a book. It's called Pragmatic Thinking and Learning. It's easily the best book uh, that came out from the Pragmatic Bookshelf. It's uh, really nice to read and it changed my life. It probably changed yours. So, as I said, I'm going to break this into four sections. I'm at the end of my first sections. Now we have four minutes for Q&A discussions. Yes? If I understood you correctly, you are uh, saying that it is good to stay in the zone as much as possible when we are the most productive. Yes. Uh, Uncle Bob says otherwise. What is your opinion about this? What does he say? Uh, first of all, he says we should avoid the zone at all costs so that we can uh, have a larger uh, perspective on our code and on our production of code, our programming. Fair enough. So in that case, I should say, find a way to like uh, get the perspective occasionally while still being able to go in the zone. Like, uh, for example, find a way to be able to spend 30 minutes in the zone and then spend 30 minutes outside the zone so you can take a perspective. And then go back again if you really need to do something hard. Since if, if your problem is hard to solve, the zone is where you want to be. Okay. And of course there are different types of work, so why MMV? Anything else? Yes. Question. You said you had three notebooks and you, uh, you write manually? Yeah, yeah, I how, I how do you synchronize it? <laughs> I, I, really, I really don't. Like there's something really personal for me with paper and written work that I really like it for some reason. It's kind of annoying since I cannot search. But it still works better for me. Okay. I tried using Evernote and it did not work for me. It worked for a lot of my friends, but not for me. So yeah, it's problematic. Okay? Yeah. Have you tried using a uh, Kanban board instead of notes? Uh, I tried, no, like not personally. I've used Kanban and Team, and I find that this is where it works best, where you need to like get a couple of different people on the same page. Yeah. But personally, I think I can organize myself with you know something like with something that's more lightweight, even like a bar. Personally, yeah. Do you have a signed calendar as an example I can use? If you have a normal calendar, where do you put actions that you have to X to get the chain? Yeah, like uh, I, I have a small app for that. Okay. Uh, but uh, before, like uh, when I when I use it to lose weight, I just get a small calendar in my like small moleskin calendar. I think you can see a pattern of me and moleskins where I would like mark it on each day, so I, I won't get like a way to see my. 
chance, but they have to like go over a couple of pages and see how long they did this. So just one kind of the bright paper. Almost. Yeah, if you, if, you, if you have to put it on the wall, you can do it that way. Or you can like come up with things, like using different colors or something. It will still work. Again, if you have some tricks of your own, please feel free to share. I used uh, for some version of this uh, calendar, but also with hours. So I mean, how, my, how many hours a day I studied for certain subject and then tried to chain it up more and more. Okay, cool. And it's really helpful. Cool. Uh, anything else? Yeah. As for timers, I've used a couple of times Pomodoro technique, so it really helped me a lot. Okay, the Pomodoro technique, okay. I assume you don't have anything else to add, so I'm going to go forward and talk about work. Now, the first, the first suggestion is maybe the most controversial, and it says no instant messengers. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, eliminating distractions is the key to achieving flow, and instant messengers are the mother of all distractions. There's literally, no, literally nothing that's more distracting than instant messengers. And I really do mean to turn them off. Like going into D and D mode or just not replying does not work. Uh, it takes just one long close friend to ruin your day. <laughs> like you have this childhood friend, you haven't seen him for like a year, and he writes something to you on Skype, and you're whoa, what's up? He haven't seen you in a while, and there goes your productivity. Like m maybe it doesn't ruin your day. Maybe you have a good day since you reconnected with somebody from your childhood, but you don't get much work done. Furthermore, the price for distraction is twofold. You pay the time to deal with the distraction, to reply, but you also pay the time to recover the context you had before you were distracted. You spend some effort remembering where you were and what you were doing. Uh, of course, I realize that most of us have to be online, so something at work is creating a separate Skype account, for example, and you give this only to your co-workers, not your friends. Furthermore, I suggest uh, carrying this slide to all kinds of notifications. Get no notifications for email, Twitter, or Facebook, even on your phone. <laughs> like, do those things in your own time. A second trick I use is I use two browsers. I use Chrome for work, and I use Firefox for personal stuff. Uh, in Chrome, I'm not logged in Facebook, I'm not logged in Twitter, I'm not logged in anything except GitHub and my uh, work email, and I even have Reddit and Hacker News blocked. I can always access them by firing Firefox, but they keep Firefox closed all the time. And even, even the small effort to open a new browser helps me a lot to not get distracted. It's a really nice hack. Of course, you can choose any two browsers. Uh, I don't recommend specifically Chrome and Firefox in this arrangement. You can even have different profiles on the same browser. A nice bonus is that you can customize it for the job at hand. My Firefox has my, all my personal crap in its bookmarks and toolbars. And my Chrome does not have any personal stuff, so I can have like the other complexity there, all the bookmarks I from my work. Number nine. Uh, it's a specific way of using to-do list. Uh, I learned that from Kent Beck, Kent Beck, I think. And here's, let me tell you how it works. So you start with an empty list and you write down everything you have to do today. And afterwards, you pick up an item and start. And while you're performing this item, you'll discover that you have other things to do. Maybe you need to refactor this function. Maybe you need to change this class name. Maybe you need to send an email. Maybe you need to take note. Here's the important part. Don't interrupt what you're currently doing to do the refactoring or to send the email. Write them down in the list. Continue with your task, finish it. And afterwards, uh, when you're done, pick another app, maybe that you just wrote. But don't interrupt yourself. Keep focused on one thing. And like finally, at the end of the day, you can carry the unfinished items for tomorrow. So again, first, it's important not to interrupt yourself. This will break your flow. And second, it's important not to task your brain in keeping track of what you need to do. It's way easier on your mind if you write it down and you forget about it and continue doing what you were doing before. 
here are a couple of things applicable to refactoring scope, phone calls, emails, even taking notes. I will often write taking note notes. I continue with that link. Here's how my list looks at the beginning of the day. You can see that I use paper. Here's, here's how it looks at the end of the day. Some stuff are crossed, some stuff I'll carry on the next day. Here's another radical one. Schedule email checks. By this I mean, pick some specific time slots for dealing with email, and then read your email only in those two slots. Why? First, dealing with unexpected email can distract you. Maybe you're, maybe you're uh, not on Skype, but the long close friend would write an email. And now you're stuck in writing a one hour long email just to reply. Furthermore, once you open your inbox, you don't know how much time you're going to spend there. It's very unpredictable. And like finally, at the end of that spot, try to have your, uh, yeah, uh, sorry. Like basically, you should control your email. You should not let your email control you. You should deal uh, with uh, email on your own time, not deal with email when your email wants you to deal with it. I was going to say that at the end of, the, at the end of each session, you should try to leave your inbox empty, also known as inbox zero. So I fear that the perfect schedule will be twice a day. I, I've, I haven't gotten that far. I think I check my email like six times a day. But I think it would be nice if I manage. Maybe it's not very realistic. Realistic. Number 11, the Pomodoro technique. Uh, I'm not going to go far into it. I'm just going to say that it's my secret weapon. It uh, fits quite well with all the other things I am talking about in this talk. And it's really sweet. I encourage, I encourage all of you to like check it out. Don't, don't just go on the site to try to find this book. Another chromatic picture book is quite short and has pictures, so it's easy to read. And even if you don't end up using the Pomodoro technique, it has a lot of good ideas about productivity that you might find useful later. And finally, touch that. As programmers, we are professional typists. Basically, we spend our days typing on a keyboard. And we, we tend to think that, uh, we tend to say that typing is not the problem. Thinking is the problem. It's way more uh, way way harder to like design a system properly than to type the code. But typing can be the bottleneck if your speed is low. And the same goes for for like interruptions. If you type really slow, you might forget why you started typing in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> this is really really evident when you have a fast typer pair programming with a slow typer. If the slow typer is at the keyboard, the fast typer gets really confused since he's used to, okay, let's write this and get the feedback way faster. <laughs> I personally type fast and if I type, if I pair with somebody who's slow, I, I find it hard to focus. So I'm going to make the bold claim that if we are programmers, uh, the minimum speed we should have is 80 words per minute, the good speed would be 100 words per minute. And yeah, I'm, I, I'm pretty certain by those numbers. Like I have repetitive strain injury and I can type with 100 words without a problem. The good news is that this is quite easy to achieve. Just pick a typing tutor and spend 10 minutes a day with it. Doing touch typing. By touch typing, I mean 10 fingers without looking at the keyboard. Should go without saying. You will get results in less than a month. And this is really important. Don't stress your hands. Like if it starts being painful or tiresome, just like rest and slow down. You really don't want to injure yourself. It might be very career trainer. And finally, this is my personal belief, but I don't think that you need to learn an alternative alternative layout like Borak or Coleman. Quirk is fine, especially if not if you're not an English speaker. An English speaker. Like both of those are optimized for typing text, but we don't type text, we type code. Of course, you see a lot of street cred. You're extremely cool if you're doing it in Borak. You can impress your friends, but I don't really see any other, any other benefits. And again, we are at this point of the talk. Questions, comments, or other ideas? 
if uh, we discover that we have new tasks to do while we are doing the current tasks and we start to noting it, isn't that an interruption already and we require other time to get back to continue our task? Yeah, well, it's a very small interruption. Like, it takes you a couple of seconds to write down what you need to write down. And more importantly, you don't need to, like, start analyzing the new task. You're just writing something down and continuing. It's way different if you notice that you need to refactor something and, like, you need to take one minute to either rename a class or variable or uh, think about how to refactor this function. It's like, okay. And uh, you said 80 words per minute. Yeah. That's uh, that's text or code? Because that's, that's text. That's text. Because writing code with parentheses and all the other outs in the other, it's yeah. not 80. Yeah, that's, that's current. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, how you deal with the uh, interruption that you cannot avoid, like some colleague of you is coming and ask for help? Okay, this is really nice. So I tend to use the Pomodoro technique. And this means I focus for 25 minutes and then I rest for 25 minutes. Uh, sorry, I rest for 5 minutes. So I get this cat <laughs> and, uh, and uh, those cat phones. And whenever I wear them, my colleagues know that I'm in a Pomodoro. And they would, I would come to my desk and yeah, they agree. A Pomodoro, I'm going to come back later. So they just don't, this, uh, don't interrupt me. Or if it's really important, uh, they would interrupt me and I would stop my Pomodoro and go and help them. But basically I've established this like, little barrier for people to interrupt me. Uh, and uh, if it's uh, an interruption that's not necessary, that's not critical, they, they just don't do it. Like, I think that can help is having earphones in your, in your ears. Like listening to music, people are less likely to, like to interrupt you. You don't really need to be listening to anything. You don't even need to have plugged the earphones anywhere. <laughs> Just having earphones then keep people away. Yeah. It's kind of anti-social. Then you then you take breaks. You know, yeah. You can also add a sign on your desk. I mean, Pomodoro to Yeah, that's a good idea. I actually have a, an there's an application called Tomato List where everybody can see that I'm in the Pomodoro and how much time is left. It's really useful. Question. I think 25 minutes is enough to start working and concentrating and be productive and then stopping for 5 minutes and doing something else? Yeah, if you, if you really get used to it. Like, it's, not, it's not easy for like the first two weeks, but afterwards when you start a timer, you suddenly go into flow and like, you forget about the rest of the world. Okay. Uh, it's like hard to adapt. There's a period where this just won't happen. But after a while, you get used to it. So it does get better. Yeah, it does get better. Uh, it's all explained in that book. <laughs> of course, like I've heard that some people tend to do shorter or longer pomodoros. I stick to 25 since I like convention over configuration. Okay, anything else? Yeah. Do you have any larger breaks? I mean only those five minutes or well like I I do three pom I do three pomodoros with five minute breaks, then a, a fifteen minute break. Occasionally, you throw in a lunch break somewhere, so yeah, keep on breaks. Isn't Pomodoro, uh, in a, isn't Pomodoro against uh, communication in the team? I mean, we are interrupting ourselves much, much frequently than 25 minutes. Yeah, I'm saved by the time. <laughs> <laughs> Short answer is no, but I need to elaborate. Anyway, let's carry on. How to be productive while writing code? First and more obvious, utilize shortcuts. <coughs> I don't think it needs saying, but with shortcuts you tend to do more things in less time, just like uh, when you type fast. Shortcuts could come in all shapes and sizes, and I suggest learning more, or at least trying to learn more. Here are some tips. First, introduce them gradually. Try one or two new shortcuts a day. There is simply no way where you can learn 30 new shortcuts per day. Second, have a cheat sheet and put it next to your monitor. That way, if you forget something, you can quickly look it up. And then third, we read this cheat sheet occasionally. There are two reasons. First, there will be shortcuts that you learn and then forget about. And second, it's good to know what sharp shortcuts you have available. That way, when you encounter a problem that you can do with the key combination, 
you might remember to look it up. Here are some examples from Eclipse. This shortcut, which on Mac is shift, uh, is control shift and the up arrow, selects a larger region. It keeps expanding the region you've selected. Uh, and the second one is the extract local variable refactoring. So if you're proficient with Eclipse, you probably do this. You hear this code and you want to extract the parameter to system out print LM to the arrival. You put your cursor there and you keep hitting this shortcut until this is selected. Then you hit the shortcut, you type the message and you get your variables, variable extracted. That's at least how I used to do it when I wrote Java. Here are some cooler ones in Z shell. Escape Q pauses the command you just typed. It clears it and lets you write another command. After this is finished, it restores what you typed originally. This is very useful if uh, while writing a command, you remember you need to execute something else first. You don't need to delete and start all over again. You can just pause it. Escape H opens the man page of the command you're currently typing. When you exit man, it returns you to the unfinished command. And finally, Escape E uh, opens, it, opens it in your editor. You can change it there and then go back to your shell. Really useful. This is a neat little trick. So use Selenium ID to all pages. Selenium ID is not Selenium, it's part of the project. It's a Firefox plugin that allows you to record macros and then to replay them. Basically, every time you're, you're testing a JavaScript interaction by hand, because you cannot write a test for this or something, Instead of doing it manually, you, you can just record the macro and run it, then you control it away. It's quite nice. <coughs> 15. Use shell aliases. Basically, create shell aliases for all the commands you run often. There are three ways in which that is useful. First, it would allow you to run commands faster. Second, it would allow you to customize commands. And finally, it would make long commands useful. Here are some examples. If I need to run my tests in a Rails project, I just type RSC. This short Rails spec cucumber. It's quite a long command to run everything. I do this like 40 or 50 times a day, so it's very good command for it. Same goes for running migrations. Note that uh, micros change just the first part of the command, so you can, you can parameterize them, you can use them for commands that are slightly different every time like generating a migration rails every migration should have a different name. Or for running bundle exec, which I guess you guys don't know about this because you don't do Ruby. I'd love to hear. Second one, you can customize commands. Uh, for example, I always want my TMUX to run with 256 colors. And that's why every time I type TMUX, it actually is being replaced with Tmux minus 2. And then, uh, by default, Clojure doesn't have uh, read line support, so I cannot go back in the history of the repo. This is not very nice, it has to do with the, the read line library. But there is this nice little tool called wrap, which can add read line functionality to basically anything. And I've realized by Clojure command in my shell to run wrap and then Clojure. And that's how I have read line when I run the show. And finally, when I use Git, I really like to sort this out. It's a very nice out. It since it shows all the branches, all the merges, all the different uh, heads. But what's bad about it is that it's quite a long, quite the long command. I really don't want to type git log grab decorate pretty one line of rest to me all every time I want to see that's why I have this, this last. Git L O L A. <laughs> By the way, note that Git has the lasses, like shells have lasses. And finally, if I want to run Spectre, uh, this is this is a uh, tool that uh, breaks your tests on like many different processors on the same machine or even on network machines. I need to type quite a long command. I need to type bundle exec since you always type this when you're doing uh, rails. I need to do xvfd run in order to not have a Firefox Windows pop up. 
and I need to specify a certain port that happens to be uh, happens to be occupied on my current machine. This way, it's not actually automated in some way. It's not committing version control. See, this is my personal command for running tests. But still, I don't have to write this like long thing every time. I just write SPG, SPG. There's a project called Oh My Z Shell, uh, which is a customization of Z Shell, and you can hunt it for quite nice ideas about lasses. So, Garden Watcher, two Ruby gems. Both of them monitor your file system, and both of them wrap and changes. The most popular way to use them is to run your tests immediately when you save a file. For example, when you save the user RB file, it immediately runs uh, user test.rb. This is called continuous testing. It's really cool since uh, it's like the, the fastest feedback you can get from your tests. And that's at least one way to use guard, or, or guard and watcher or their equivalent for your environment. But there are other cool uses, like you can use them for compilation, for static checking, linting, toying stuff, even checking out the repository. Again, there's a book, it's a short talk. 17. Case stuff locally. Basically, if you look at it often, keep it on your machine. It doesn't really matter how fast your internet connection is. You still pay a penalty to access it over the wire. As a bonus, you can use it when you're on an airplane or when your ISP is down. Furthermore, putting things within an arm's reach makes it more likely for you to use them. For example, I really enjoy reading the Pragmatic magazine, but I find that I just can't bother to open their site every now and then. Uh, I wrote a small script that just downloaded everything on my machine and now I can open it with Alfred way faster. You can if there's no easy way to like cache things locally, you can use wget. It can download their sites, or you can write your own shell script, or your own scripts that do this. And finally, spike when uncertain. This is an interesting point. I don't know about you, but for me, it's very hard to test drive from unfamiliar technology. Especially if this unfamiliar technology is a framework, something I need to know how to fit in. Every time I do that, I tend to like write the test, then implement it, then learn something, and then go back refactoring the test. Know that I go back refactoring the test, not like writing new functionality or refactoring the production code. This is called EI shaping, and it's really not nice. So what I like doing is I like doing spikes. Basically, I stop writing tests for a while, I time box myself, say two hours, and I write some throwaway code just to like learn something. I would even put my cowboy hat on, so I can go really cowboy on the coat. Uh, like I don't care about, I don't care about uh, keeping it clean. I don't care about making it clear. I don't care about having tests. After I've done this and I have learned what I need to run, I throw it away and I clean it up from scratch. And it's really important. You need to resist the urge to keep it. Nine times out of ten, it won't be good code. Yeah. Yeah. Another question on observation is I found the watcher pretty difficult to to configure for each small project every time, and uh, I think there are better solutions like uh, many IDs can automatically save your files when you hit test. For example, NetBeans. If you hit the test button, it will save your plot files to make sure that it is what it has to be. Or uh, many IDs have this functionality of action on save. So yeah, that's, that, that I think Watcher is uh, is getting a little bit in the way. Yeah, that's a fair point. Uh, Watcher specifically is kind of outdated. It hasn't been updated in two years. Like Guard is the new cool thing in Ruby, at least. And of course, if you have it in your IDE. You don't need to. You don't need to like learn Guard. But the point is that if you know Guard, you can maybe build a tool that you don't have in your IDE. You can use it for something else, like linking your JavaScript if you don't have, or linking your iced coffee script. I really doubt that there would be an iced coffee script plugin for Eclipse. 
goods. Yeah. No, but there is an action that you there is an action on save, so you can basically execute yeah. anything you want. Fair enough, fair enough. That's kind of, that's kind of the same thing. That's yes. Yeah. But inside the ID not in some like Fair enough. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Final part, tools. So automate your environment. And by this, autom I mean automate everything you can possibly automate. It's nice. You don't type, you don't think about how you need to do it, and you make a lot less errors since it's automated. But maybe most importantly, automation can store knowledge. Once you write a deploy script for your project, this script can serve as living documentation of how your project is deployed. You have an array of tools. You can do it with shell scripting, you can do it with build tools like Rake, Make, or Ant, or you can use a full blown programming language to do your automation. I'm just going to give you some examples. And first of all, the first one is, is installing my personal configuration. So I tend to use some pretty standard tools like Vim, Z Shell, and Tmux that uh, are on every Unix uh, distribution or can be easily installed. So if you give me a new PC and uh, if I want, if you want me to get myself products from this new PC, I need to clone this repo and I need to run this command. Afterwards, I'll have all my personal configuration for all the tools I use. I don't have a command that upgrades my Vim clients. It's a it's a red street. Another example. Me and a couple of friends did uh, <coughs> structure and interpretation with the problem study group last year. Uh, during the study group, we had to solve exercises and uh, we had to solve exercises. And for each exercise, I won't have tests. So I ended up creating two files: one for the exercise and one for the test. That quickly got tedious, so I decided to automate this. I would write Ray to generate something. It would create a file for the exercise, for the solution. It would have a header, which would say this exercise 314. It would create a file for the test. It would add the scaffold, like all the code I need to start writing tests. It would start working as testing immediately. So as soon as I save any of those files, I would see whether my test passed. And finally, it opened both of them in the currently open and I even had rate next, so I didn't need to know uh, which exercise, I didn't need to type which is the current exercise. It just saw, it just figured out what was the last one and generated the next one. If you have to do this like 200 times manually, it tends to be quite annoying. A very simple example. If I need to install my SSH key on a new machine, I just do this. It's a root script. I enter my password and it's there. I'm proposing to carry this to the extreme, like try automating everything you can automate. You eventually end up wasting time performing the necessary automation, but you get better at automation. So after spending uh, some amount of time, waste time on unnecessary automation, you'll be able to automate stuff way faster. <coughs> 23. Build your own tools. And here's where it gets a bit messy. So basically, try building tools for all. Try building tools when the need for the need for them arises. Small tools. I I think that we can. I, I can see two kinds of tools. Like tools you use often, you, like you build it and then you use it every day or every other day or something. And tools you build, you use and then throw away, which I'm going to call one-offs. So let me show you some examples. Uh, a few years ago, there was uh, no way to access the Bulgarian railroad system through your phone. Their site was pretty crappy. So a friend of mine took Python, like did some script screen scraping, and in one hour, like he had a very basic uh, web interface on his server, uh, which he can use to like see when is the next train. Another friend of mine tends to like check a lot of sites each day, he created a small application and that would remind him which sites he needs to check today. 
and he can modify them. He even has a link to open all the sites in different tabs. And here's a like, really weird example that I really like. Um, it's from a company I worked with. We had this policy, we started this policy where everybody had to read all the commits. We had to list every day. And it was really important to comment on GitHub everything you did not like or you thought that can be improved. The best, work, what worked best for me was to do this once a day in a block of time and then don't bother until the next day. Probably the start of the day. I had two options. I could open GitHub.com and do it there, but this was slow and clumsy. I really don't like their interface. Or I like their interface, but I can do way better in my terminal. But if I do git log, I don't have an easy way to comment. I need to see the commit name, then open github.com, and find it there, and then comment. And that was not nice. So I like, created this, this command. And when I run it, it shows me all the commits in the last 24 hours. And then I can use the arrow keys to go forward and back. And what's most important, there's a where you are out there. When I click it, I go to the page and I can comment. And I basically used like duct tape for this. This was git shell scripting and less. It's like the dirtiest way possible. I don't think you guys can like figure this code, it's just that the bit, but it works. And when you're building your own tools, you have like this array. You can either like do it properly, make a small application, or you, you can just like build up something with tools, you know. For example, I knew that less can be customized. You can have your own key shortcuts there, and I did that. So I would suggest using those for making small web applications, like Sinatra RB or Flask if you're a Python guy, or Guru Dancer if you're a Guru guy, and like simple databases, Redis and Mongo. You can even use Twitter Bootstrap if you don't care about all your applications looking the same way. And here's an example from one of two. Like I was working for this fashion startup and we decided to sell bunny heads for Easter. It was actually a hit, especially in China, I remember that. Uh, where the customer could uh, customize their, their hats. They could choose the color of the hat, they could choose the color of the bow tie and the patch in the ears. Uh, this led to like 96 versions and we needed four different sizes for each version. Our designer was like, scared he had to do that, but since we are programmers, we just did something. We wrote some code that generated that from like a couple of templates. We even wrote uh, some code that generates this image uh, with like random assortment of hats and our logo here and there. And then we did 50 of those and let our designer pick up which one he likes best for the background of the page. And we just did some Z shell on image. Like you can do crazy stuff with image magic and this here is simple enough for this case. So this is an example of uh, one of two. Like uh, we wrote it in an hour, we ran it and we threw it away. Now, I suggest keeping those one off somewhere. They make great references for the future. If I need to do some image magic stuff, I would remember that I wrote this script some, some time ago and I would go and see what I have written there and use as a reference. 21. By the way, who here does not use an IDE? Nice. So, uh, personalize your editor and I assume step zero is pick a generic editor. Not an ID, an editor. This represents my opinion about editors, about generic editors, and you think it's best. Now, I want to make a point. I don't want to say that ID is like, I don't want to make, uh, I don't want to start really just flaming. IDs are fine. Uh, my Java productivity in Eclipse will always be way better than my Java productivity in Vim. I'm pretty certain of that. Where Vim has been really useful for me is uh, environments where I don't have a good ID. When I started doing Ruby, there was not a good ID in Ruby. I would make the claim that there still isn't one. All the cool new languages, Scala, Clojure, Haskell, Erlang, whatever. They don't have as good IDs. They either have like sucky IDs or, or no IDs at all. 
even even if I'm familiar with Eclipse, I'm way more proficient in my view than I mean in like the closure plugin for Eclipse. And this is an important point uh, where when you know really well an editor, you carry your text editing expertise to every new environment you go to. If if I was a poor programmer and I need to become a Ruby programmer, it's pretty easy for me. I don't need to learn new ID. Also, we tend to live in our editors, or IDs, if you will, and all improvements we can squeeze out of them are worth it, even the small ones. Uh, furthermore, if we talk about like Beam or Emacs or TextMate, uh, they tend to have lots of plugins. They have way more plugins than you have for Eclipse, and that's because they're easier to write. Like Beam script sucks, but it's still easier to write than an Eclipse plugin. And that's a great way to improve your workflow. You just like find something that somebody else wrote that works for you, you modify it a bit, and then off you go. 22. I suggest learn the existing tools. Uh, play as many tools as you can and try to. This is important because if you know uh, if you know what the tool can do, you know how you can build it up into something larger. I knew that I could post. Uh, I knew that I could compose images with Image Magic, and I knew how to. Read. And I like. I, I knew that. Yeah. I knew. Sorry. And when you're learning tools, dive deep. Like try doing things the hard way. Again, it might. Uh, you might end up wasting time, like not being productive. But at least you would learn. And here are some tools that I suggest checking out, like your editor, of course, Git, and whatever you can do with it, ZShell, some form of text processing, like all can set if you want to go really hardcore, or if you don't, or anything else really. Current W getter useful, TMUX is nice, image magic, and especially graphics. This is very, very nice for doing visualizations cheaply. I'm, I'm saying that it's nice to dive into all those tools, see what they can do, and then later when you need them, uh, you still have to look them up, but you'll know that the functionality is there. I'm almost done. So 23 is learn from others, like talk with your coworkers, pair with them, you can see what shortcuts they're using, and even try their crazier ideas. Like a friend of mine uh, had this idea, never mind that. You can actually also look for ideas in GitHub. Many people publish their dot files online. You can hunt for cool ideas. Or you can watch some screencasts. Those two are two very popular screencasts in the Ruby community. Uh, like PeepCode has this series uh, play by play where you see experienced programmers solving problems and you can hear them reason about, about uh, their process and destroy all software is like a really cool screencast where this guy this guy does crazy stuff with his beam and his shell. And finally share what you learned. Like publish it in GitHub, blog about it, give a talk. Just put it out there, it will be useful for some for somebody.
at a specific time, revert your all your changes. So if you in 10 minutes you didn't commit, you are back where you were. Fair enough. <laughs> I can see the road plans for it. Yes. So in order to become more efficient, we have to monitor all actions that you do. So what kind of tools do you use or how do you analyze how efficient you are? Yeah. Uh, how, how do you know that you made a good choice? Yeah, like most of the time I tend to go on cat feeling. Uh, I, I can tell that uh, today I spent a lot of time being confused or today I spent a lot of time, get, lot of time getting cracked up. But uh, I tend to go with the Pomodoro technique. So I would, I first can count the number of Pomodoros I did. And then like each, each Pomodoro I do is like related to something. Like do this task or implement this feature. And I can basically tell, uh, I can basically see, yeah, I, I have some metrics in, in terms of how many Pomodoros I did today and how many Pomodoros certain tasks take. So over the time I would see that I would do more Pomodoros and accomplish more with two less Pomodoros. It's not like super rigorous, yeah. It's like you're not trying to measure the actual tool that you use, just how you react to it, how, how efficient you are as a person. Yeah, I mean, I would try everything. Yeah, I would really love to like measure how efficient I am, but I just do not come up with good things to measure that are actually objective. Okay. So I, I, most of the time I just like go on that thing. But by all means, if you can find something to measure, go ahead. Yeah, yes. Since an ID an editor plus some extra tools like unit test integration and the ID can know about the language and interpret the, the working of your code. What is your uh, your point against an ID and for an editor only? So I see an editor like a dumb ID. Yeah, fair enough. I, I agree, but there are, there, there are two things here. First, you don't always have an ID. Again, if you want to closure right now, you won't have a good ID. You have some ID, but it will suck. And uh, you like you would actually have way poor Emacs plugins and Vim plugins. Then you would have Git plugins for closure. And second, uh, dump editors are easier to customize. I've pinned my Vim a lot. It did a lot of crazy stuff. I could not do this in Eclipse. It was way more effort to customize my Eclipse. Okay. So you probably have noticed that they tend to recommend books. I'm going to recommend them more. Uh, one of them is called The Productive Programmer. It's a short book, nice ideas. It basically covers all operating systems and uh, different approaches, like what is for Ruby people and Java people. And the second one is all about overcoming procrastination. It's called The, Night, the Now Habit, and it has some neat ideas. Uh, from what I can tell, I'm finishing one minute earlier. Sorry. Go ahead. From what I can tell, I'm finishing one minute earlier. So thank you for your time. And if you if you want to talk to me about this stuff, just find me somewhere. I'd love to.